recap from the session that we had uh, yesterday. Um, the key takeaway messages from the presentation delivered by the UNFCC Secretariat yesterday, which was titled uh, UNFCC Enhanced Transparency Reporting uh, Requirements. We received uh, an updated information on the reporting requirements under the ETF, which means that countries have to do, among other things, uh, produce a national inventory report every two years uh, using the common reporting tables uh, for the electronic reporting of the information that is presented in their national greenhouse gas reports. Uh, also, we were updated on the changes in the reporting format as well as the submission timelines for the BTRs. Um, we also had a discussion which came out of the breakout groups and um, participants identified uh, the need to recognize uh, capacity building needs uh, to enable them to report under this an, a report, new reporting format, but also not only for the greenhouse gas inventories, but also for the common uh, tabular format, as well as the, the choice and use of um, indicators for tracking policies. Um, we also had a presentation from the PACMA Secretariat and, and, and jointly with FAO on the introduction to the uh, Bay Annual Transparency Report Guidance and Roadmap Tool. Essentially, we, we learned what this tool can do and what it does not do. We learned that the tool is actually meant to support developing countries and guide developing countries in planning their preparation processes for the first BTRs, as well as uh, preparing a roadmap for, for implementing the BTR. We also were told that the tool guides countries in setting up their BTR submissions following the guidance in the MPGs, as well as uh, it is structured around the MPGs as well. Um, it also helps countries to better understand uh, their actions uh, with an indicative time frame, as well as a um, Gantt chart that is produced to help you structure your work. The tool does not um, calculate or estimate emissions. It also does not do projections. So I think we had also an input from the FAO where they said once the tool has been piloted in a few countries and the FAO will share best practices uh, regarding the tool at a later date. Uh, just to, by way of introduction, today we will um, essentially cover understanding of the 2006 IPCC guidelines with regards to the reporting um, reporting requirements for the creation of a consistent time series, as well as the definitions of land use categories. We will also hear from South Korea's experience in applying the 2006 um, guidelines in the land use sector. Uh, then there will be a presentation from UK Ricardo ourselves, the team on the understanding of um, adapting national land use classifications and aligning them with the um, IPCC land uses. We will also look a little bit at the of the of the Paris Agreement and the common reporting tables for the Lulu CF sectors, and also think about what countries should be doing in order to uh, report and estimate emissions uh, using these um, new tables. So, um, with that said, I will. Uh, maybe we have a quick little icebreaker uh, with our Mentimeter, like we did yesterday. Uh, again, um, Marcelo will provide you with the, okay, there you go, there's a slide, there are the questions. We be grateful if you can maybe tell us what your experience is with using the IPCC 2006 guidelines in the Lulu CF sector. And again, highlight what are the main challenges for creating a consistent time series of the IPCC land use categories and also your challenges in trying to generate a land use metrics. So if you go to www.mentimeter.com, when you log in, you can use that code like we did yesterday. Hello, everybody. So please uh, go to menti.com. Uh, the code is 923 and the first question is, what is your experience with the 2006 IPCC guidelines in the Lulu CF sector? Uh, let's wait to people to start to put the, the responses. We're going to see here in the screen, and then we can move for the second uh, question. Uh, 
So please go ahead and share your experience. Please don't be shy. Okay, we have a first response that uh, no experience. Want to learn more about it? Maybe in the time being, people are putting the response. Rosia, if you want to also give a kind of welcome from PAPTA side, please go ahead. In the meantime, people will put the, the responses in Mentimeter. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Marcelo. I wanted yeah, to... Actually, today, uh, Don Hyukshin from GIR was supposed to join us and... Um, the unfortunately Don Hugh uh, could not join today's uh, session, uh, uh, but uh, we are happy that the colleagues from uh, the Greenhouse Gas Inventory uh, Research Institute are joining today because we jointly together with them and together with colleagues from FAO prepared this workshop. So still happy that Milan and, and Munjung will be uh, attending today. And today also we will hear from the experience of South Korea in applying the IPCC guidelines. But uh, of course, I also once again wanted to welcome you all who joined today's session. And uh, I hope that we have prepared another interesting and exciting topics to discuss and to exchange about. And yes, uh, let's see. Um, what's new uh, we will learn from today and uh, what uh, will be the outcome by today's session and also to the exchanges among the participants. So please be active in sharing your experiences and asking questions and uh, also giving us some interesting insights that we probably also should be aware of in our work. Thank you and over to you, Marcelo. Thanks. OK, so now we have more responses here. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, people that have uh, engaged here has uh, told us that there is not yet experience and they are keen to learn it. And of course, this is one of the main purpose of today is to start to present uh, a little bit the requirements under the 2006 HPCC guidance, in particular in relation to the land use matrix, land use, uh, land classifications. So we hope we can start uh, giving you some uh, advice. Of course, uh, the time is short and we'll not be able to go uh, much more in details, but uh, this is just a start and we will be keen to assist you in, in other activities in the future. So let's move for the second question now. So what are the main challenges for creating a consistent time series of IPCC land use categories and land use change matrix? Uh, of course, uh, as the responses uh, in the previous slide indicated, not all of you have experience. So uh, when you respond to this question, even if you don't have experience with the IPCC, uh, just tell us about what, uh, uh, in your view, is the challenge to have a consistent time series uh, of the, these land use categories. And we are saying here forest land, agriculture, uh, pasture land, uh, settlements, other use. So how you see that uh, uh, what will be the challenges to have these uh, time series of these 
use of the lands and how you also uh, make a uh, record or track the changes between the lands use. This is what is the main purpose of the land use change matrix. We have a first uh, response, no full and accurate data. That definitely is one of the main challenges for sure. Maybe I, I can uh, incentivize a little bit by saying that uh, based on this no full and accurate data, I think this is one of the main challenges for developing countries uh, because we uh, normally will have to collect this information from uh, other institutions or, or ministries and sometimes they don't have these for all the years. You may find maps for uh, that covers the whole country for particular years, but you don't have a consistent uh, production of such maps. So you're going to have in a long time series uh, a lot of gaps between years. So you, you will not be 100 percent sure what was the use of the land in your country in one particular year or what changes have happened between the years. So I think this is another challenge you may find. Uh, in the time series, maps or information that allow you to have uh, the numbers of actors in each land use category. But what happened between the years, most of the times you don't have this information available uh, and then you will be uh, having more challenges in produce the time series, uh, a consistent time series, and, and to demonstrate through the land use change matrix uh, what was the change between the land use categories? Yeah, maybe just to complement uh, what Marcelo is saying, I think this is also one sector where uh, land surveys are not done on an annual basis. Maybe they are done every five to ten years. Again, it means that you also need to check if those maps are using the same definitions of land use classification. I think part of what we are going to be uh, covering today is to look at how we align uh, the, the national land use classifications with the IPCC uh, categories as well. And also the introductory um, presentation from FAO, from uh, Iodanis, will also look at um, basically supporting you in generating a consistent time series of the land uses. Yeah, thank you, Zekai. Okay, we have more uh, now responses, methods or equipment using for data collection. Yes, that's one challenge. There are some gaps between national statistics and land cover maps for each categories. Under the name of improvement in national reporting, data change between years. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you still can uh, use this uh, code if you want to put your responses a little bit later. So uh, I will stop here my the presentation of the Mentimeter. But as I said, please feel free to go there and put your responses. We're going to use this for the report. Uh, so let's now move back to to the other presentation. Sakai, back to you. Thank, thank you, Marcelo. Um, and um, yes, um, our first presentation today will be um, coming from um, Ayodanis from the FAO. And that will actually look at the issues on understanding the IPCC 2006 guidelines for the creation of a consistent time series. Um, Yodanis, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sweetie. Can you let me know when you, you are able to see my screen? Y yes. And um, not in full presentation mode yet, but we can see. Yeah, yes. OK. Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Jordanis Zantis. I'm, uh, I'm working uh, at FAO uh, in Rome uh, in the NDC Enhancement Support Team of, in the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment. I have to say that 
the, the, the responses we got through the Mentimeter is, are quite interesting and uh, I hope that I will shed some light in these, uh, uh, in these gaps that you may have for those that you are not familiar, so, so much familiar with the IPC guidelines and the land use uh, land representation in the LULUCF sector. And for those that you are more familiar, I hope I will make some improvements in your knowledge and also I think that together with the next presentations during the day, we will have a good overview of, uh, of this, let's say, complex, uh, I have to admit, uh, issue in the LULUCF sector, which is the, the land representation. Uh, in my presentation, I will focus, I will give just a, a brief overview of uh, the requirements uh, stemming from the 2006 IPC guidelines. And starting uh, with the first slide, uh, the, the, the main question is what is land representation? So land representation is the analysis that we are making, we need to make uh, in order to, to make, to use this information from this analysis in our GAG inventory. Uh, and its purpose is to identify and to quantify the, the human activities on land and to track the changes in the land use over time. So to put it very simple, I would say that the land representation is just a simulation of, of uh, the reality in terms of land use and land use changes uh, and in order then uh, to, to transform this, uh, this information to greenhouse gas estimates. Uh, with the land representation, the, we result in a stratification of the total country area. We will speak in detail uh, we will see several slides on stratification later on. And with this stratification, basically, practically, we divide the, our country in, in, into units of land, stri strata, uh, which are homogeneous for a number of variables. We will speak also for uh, these variables. And with this stratification, at the end, we have a, a good uh, overview, a good representation of the current level of dynamic of uh, carbon stocks within the stratum in order to make our GAG inventory development uh, practicable and to enhance as much as possible the, the GAG estimates. Now, why uh, is uh, land representation uh, uh, important? This is because as you may already know when estimating uh, our GHG uh, emissions and removals uh, we need the the activity data which uh, in in its basic form uh, the equation is basically activity data multiplied by emission factor or removal factor in our case in the LULUCF sector in the case of LULUCF sector this the activity data mainly are uh, area information and this information is uh, coming from, uh, from the land representation in, in the LULUCF sector. So the activity data represent basically the magnitude of the human activity that in turn generates the greenhouse gas emissions and removals during a, a given period of time. In this graph, uh, we can see <clears throat> how land stratification is correlated with the amount of carbon stock and the dynamic of carbon stocks throughout time. And we can see that we have a forest land. Uh, here we have a forest land which uh, it's converted to, uh, to cropland. And this represents a negative uh, carbon stock dynamic because throughout time the, uh, the carbon stocks uh, are uh, decreasing. So in practice with the land representation, we try to simulate this dynamic as accurate as possible. Of course, based always on the data availability that we have. Now, uh, getting into the stratification that we spoke about before, the land, we, we know that land is characterized by biophysical variables and uh, various human activities. Uh, both those uh, variables, all these variables affect uh, the, the ecosystem processes and these processes involve the removals and the emissions of greenhouse, uh, uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, the human activities cover all impacts caused by, uh, by human activities, including uh, the disturbances. 
And here we have a, a graph uh, on the right. We see a graph of the main uh, variables that IPCC suggest uh, on based on on which, uh, in accordance to IPCC 2006 IPCC guidelines, uh, we have to stratify our land. Starting with the, the biophysical variables, the first one is the climate. Uh, climate is quite important because the temperature and the water are two main parameters determining uh, the accumulation of biomass and the emissions afterwards. Uh, we have to, to, to remember that uh, even uh, using the IPC default uh, uh, emission factors, removal factors, uh, parameters in general, uh, there is a stratification al already embedded in the IPC guidelines. So we need to, to, to try to stratify our land uh, based on these biophysical parameters. Uh, on the left, there is also a list <clears throat> of, the most, um, uh, of the most important, let's say, climate zones covering, covering most of the managed land. And on the bottom right, you can see some potential data sets that you can use in order to, to retrieve uh, information on, uh, on climate zones. And this information is uh, in a GI, they can be used in the GIS uh, uh, application. So uh, basically, there is available even in, at a global scale, uh, some information to use uh, for the climate stratification. Moving to the next biophysical uh, variable, we have the ecological zones. Again, uh, stratifying by ecological zone is equally important because <clears throat> the woody biomass is the second largest terrestrial uh, carbon pool after soil. The 2006 IPC guidelines use the FAO Global Ecological Zone Classification, and here again we have the list of uh, ecological zones on, on the left and on the right you can find some potential data sets that you can use for your inventory purposes if you don't have um, more detail or country specific uh, information. And the third biophysical uh, variable is that of soil. Uh, soil contains, uh, the, it, it constitutes the biggest carbon pool in, in, uh, in, comp in comparison to the other Two, the second we saw before it's the, the, the wood biomass. Uh, and in accordance to the 2006 IPC guidelines, we have the stratification, the classification of soils based uh, on the World Harmonized Soil Database. The two, I would say, main types of soils are the mineral soils with uh, several subcategories, subtypes and the organic soils. Uh, and again, uh, I have also included some uh, potential data, so data sets that you can use in order to, to have in a GIS uh, mode uh, the, the stratification per soil that you can, uh, uh, of course, use in the GHG inventory as a first step. Now moving to the more laborious uh, steps for the land class land representation is that of land use uh, this requires not national data we saw that some uh, colleagues already indicated some challenges that they faced uh, we will see uh, how to deal with those uh, data but we cannot avoid uh, i have to to say that here uh, we cannot avoid collecting data we cannot avoid uh, building a system that uh, identifies uh, the needs and any completeness and then to cover these gaps. And of course, the more detailed data we have, the more detailed stratification we can apply. And the, and the whole purpose of the land representation is to start with uh, with whatever we have and then uh, throughout time uh, to, to improve our, our land representation. Uh, in accordance with the 2006 IPC guidelines, <clears throat> For the land uses, the land use variable, the stratification should be uh, for the following uh, parameters, uh, managed land versus unmanaged land, the six IPC top level main land use categories, the history of the land use, and the land conversion categories. We will speak about all this in the next slides. The first one uh, is the, the separation between managed land and unmanaged land. Uh, managed land, of course, it is the land where uh, we have the human interventions and practices. 
uh, where some man land is the land where we don't have such a human intervention practices uh, occurring. Uh, for the managed land, uh, the 2006 IPC guideline uh, retained the managed land proxy, meaning that all emissions and removals from managed land should be included in our GHG inventory, whereas such emissions and removals occurring uh, on uh, unmanaged land, they don't have to be reported. However, we have to track the unmanaged land in order to keep uh, consistency of our GHG inventory and, of course, to capture any changes from and to uh, unmanaged land. For for the case of uh, managed land, the, we we have to stratify further stratify our uh, land uh, based on on the current land use uh, in accordance uh, to um, following these uh, six main uh, land use categories. These are forest land, cropland, grassland, wetland, settlements, and other land. Sekai will uh, will speak more on the definitions of this uh, of these land use categories in the next uh, presentation. Whereas for unmanaged land, <clears throat> we have to stratify based on the cover because there is no uh, any use on this uh, land, and uh, unmanaged land can be considered only for the categories of forest land, grassland, wetlands, and other land. Uh, we understand by that by default settlements and cropland cannot be uh, considered as unmanaged land. Now, can countries supply their own country uh, land use uh, definitions? And the response, of course, is that yes, countries can freely uh, choose their own uh, counter-specific definition. However, uh, in that case, an hierarchy must be established uh, among these uh, counter-specific definitions. And uh, here I just uh, put, put a note that the IPC embedded hierarchy is the following. First, firstly is forest land, then is cropland, third is grassland, then is settlements, and then uh, the next one is wetlands, and the, the last one is other land. When, when uh, we, we are developing our, our land representation is is very important to, to ensure that the entire range of land uses are represented. And we, when we are uh, applying uh, counter-specific definitions, we should uh, strive to, uh, to to have definitions in a way that we avoid mixing areas, uh, having uh, different carbon stocks and carbon stocks dynamic. For example, uh, we should avoid uh, mixing uh, in, in a country-specific definition areas where in which we have sand, for, for example, with uh, minimum, minimum or no uh, carbon stocks, with areas with a substantial amount of uh, carbon stocks. Uh, and when we have, and this is quite uh, often an issue and a challenge for the countries uh, when when we have country specific definitions based on on the land cover classes we need to come up uh, with uh, an approach in order to reconcile these uh, classes with the ipc land use categories for this we may use um, uh, auxiliary data and the the last and uh, most important in my view uh, uh, issue aspect is that the definitions should always, regardless if they are uh, the IPC default uh, definitions or the counter specific definitions, they have to apply it consistently across space and time. And this is particularly important when the methods for collecting data are uh, changing, are improving uh, through time. <clears throat> now, for the for the land uh, use stratification. Uh, within the main land use categories, we have a, a, another uh, level of uh, stratification, which is based on the history of uh, of the land use, and we have on the on the one hand the land under convention in the land use category, and as per IPC default, this conversion period is determined to 20 years. So uh, we have land that has been in in a conversion subcategory. Let's put it like that. Uh, within the last 20 years and the land that has not changed its use for the last 20 years. There is, uh, of course, you can understand that there is a different dynamic in, in the carbon stocks based on this history of land. 
and that's why we are uh, applying this uh, stratification in order then to to apply the correct uh, emissions or removal factors in in these land areas on the on the bottom right uh, you can see the the subcategorization so for each main land use category we have the subcategory uh, determining that the the land has not changed the last 20 years whereas we have also another subcategory for the cases of uh, of the land that has changed uh, has is in a conversion uh, st status for the last 20 years <clears throat> So information on historical land use is needed. It allows the application of the different carbon stock change factors according to the different type of conversions. If uh, we, for the land that uh, has, has not changed its use for the last year, the, this land, uh, according to, to the, the common reporting tables, the CRTC is reported under the category land remaining under the, under the same land use. And when the land has not changed its use, uh, has changed, uh, excuse me, uh, its use for the last 20 years, it is reported under the land converted to new land use. Uh, furthermore, we have for the case of uh, the land conversion categories, we have the, uh, the differentiation in these land conversion subcategories. According to the previous land use, in total, we have 30 land use sub change subcategories. So uh, for its uh, for its main land use, uh, the land may may be coming from all the rest uh, land use categories. So here uh, we see on the on the right uh, the subcategories for the case of the three main land use categories: the forest land, grassland, and the same is applied for the rest uh, main land. Furthermore, we can stratify the, our land based on the management system and practices. Uh, again, the management of land uh, impacts a lot of uh, the carbon stocks and carbon dynamics. Uh, we have here some management practices, uh, the main management practices recognized uh, in the IPC in 2006 IPC guidelines and also there, there is on the on the table on the right the main carbon pools that are affected uh, per each uh, ma management practice. Uh, th this presentation will be shared so you can you can see in more detail by your own. And lastly, uh, we have um, the stratification per disturbance. Uh, we have disturbances like fires, which are the most uh, common uh, ones, but we have also other disturbance types that can be used as a parameter in order to stratify our land. And of course, if there is any, any other variable to be used for stratification, for example, the three types of the crop types, uh, this could be uh, another parameter for our, uh, our stratification. Once we, we have defined our stratification scheme, then this should be applied across the, uh, the entire national territory in order to, to apply the same uh, stratification scheme for all carbon pools. Uh, and we have, of course, to apply the same stratification scheme across the entire time series. Now, uh, moving, uh, I'm going to be a, a bit quicker now. Uh, to some uh, examples also, but uh, how to do how to do this land representation according to the to, to the 2006 IPC guidelines, uh, we will see some examples. We have three approaches suggested by the IPCC. The first approach is when we have only information on the land use, uh, and we don't have any information from our data on the land use changes. We, we are able only to identify the net area change of its land use or management category over time. Uh, and we don't know uh, how, uh, our, how these uh, land use changes are translate, uh, and I, meaning we don't know from which land use the land is coming from or to which land use category the land is converted to. Uh, we have the approach too which is a more detailed approach and uh, more demanding than approach one, where we do have information on the gross uh, area land use changes, 
but we don't know uh, where exactly this land use change is occurred. And final, finally, we have the more detailed approach, the approach three, where we do have all the information that we need to, uh, in order to, to make our land representation accurate. The, the choice of the approach that we will implement, of course, depends on the availability of data over time and space. <clears throat> as, uh, as I said, approach one does not allow to, uh, to quantify uh, the, the gross changes, uh, whereas with approach two and three, we have this information, and with approach three, we have even the spatial explicit information on where each change is occurring. Uh, approaches are applied to classify the territory uh, according to the stratification scheme. <clears throat> of course, countries can uh, use an, a combination of approaches in order to, to develop their land presentation. Uh, and the most uh, effective uh, way to, to build our, consistent, uh, our land representation in a consistent manner is, uh, if possible, to apportion our land according to the uh, to, uh, to the climate, ecological zone and soil, and then to build uh, in these uh, subparts our land representation, and then to sum up all the information uh, at the end in order to develop our land presentation. The level of aggregation at which the land representation should be reported is that determined by the common reporting tables, which uh, define that we have six land remaining in the same land use categories and the associated 30 land use change subcategories. That means that we may have a detailed land uh, stratification scheme, uh, but in, in the reporting, all this information will uh, be aggregated. However, you are the countries are more than welcome, uh, I would say, are uh, encouraged to provide as detailed as possible information in the uh, national inventory document in the main body or neck uh, or an annexes in a way for the third person, the reader, to be able to understand how the land representation has been developed. And here I, I have some examples to, to better, better understand the, uh, the limitations and also the, the benefits of the approach that we use. On, on, uh, here on, on the left, we have, let's say, the, uh, the reality of what is happening in, in this case. We have uh, three units of land, each one kilo hectare, and uh, we see how this, uh, each of these units is uh, converted throughout time. The first one is from forest land, in the second year is converted to grassland, and it remains as grassland uh, uh, from that time onward. Uh, and on the, on, the, on the right, we have uh, what is the information available in the country? We can see that in the case of approach one, we simply we simply know how uh, the the land use categories are uh, converted or not converted uh, throughout time, and you can uh, see, for example, that between 1990 and 1991, the the data that we have available in this case. Does, uh, do not show any change. However, as you can see from the left part, we do have some changes. We have a forest land that is converted to grassland between 1990-1991 and the grassland converted to forest land uh, in the same year. So what we can identify only is the net changes uh, in, uh, in the year 1992, uh, where we have a, a net increase in the forest land area and a net decrease in the cropland area. <clears throat> With approach two, we have more information. We we are able to identify these gross changes, so we are able then to 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 apply the stratification uh, for the history of land. So we we start now. With more detailed data to uh, to report our land uh, based on the land that is remaining in the same land use category and the land that is converted to another land use category. Uh, and therefore, the, the outage inventory will be more accurate as uh, compared with uh, the case of approach one. Uh, with approach two, we, we are able to, uh, to represent uh, our land with the so-called land use matrices, so the information can be uh, 
converted to land use matrices where we see in each matrix in the di 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 uh, the diagonal uh, in yes uh, in when when uh, we have uh, the land use matrices uh, the row uh, as with crt 41 the rows give always the, the the sum of the areas at the beginning of the year whereas the the column uh, give us uh, the last, the last row, let's say, which is the sum of the columns, give us the land area at the end of the year. So we can see uh, in this case that the forest land is remaining forest land is one kilo hectare, cropland remaining cropland is uh, one kilo hectare, and grassland remaining grassland is one kilo hectare, whereas we don't have any changes in this case uh, between the land use categories. And in the same way, we can read uh, the rest of the matrices. So we have gross land use conversions. We don't know where these uh, land use conversions have occurred, uh, and we can build the land use matrices. And with approach three, we have the information as we see on the right. We do know each of the changes, each of the year, and we do know a spatial explicit where these uh, changes occur. Uh, therefore, it is the most accurate uh, approach to use. Uh, and although we can uh, we can uh, represent this uh, information in land use matrix mode, uh, there might be the need most likely to use uh, more uh, advanced softwares uh, in order to, uh, to to be able to manage or uh, or information because with approach three we do need uh, and we we would manage uh, a lot of information. Uh, in my final slides, I have to, to say that the time series is composed of by a number of tables uh, corresponding to the number of years. We just note that we have to develop annual GHG inventories. And also we need to know the history of land. As we say, as per IPC guidelines, we need uh, we have the 20 years conversion period. So in order to accurately uh, estimate our area for the starting year of our inventory, we need to have information uh, 20 years back in time. That means for a, an inventory starting in 1990, we need to know the land use changes occurring from 1971 onward. Uh, because any any kind of conversion uh, of land use conversion or land management conversion, it is reported in this land conversion status for 20 years. Um, to construct a consistent time series for the years before the, sta uh, the starting year of the inventory, we may use, of course, alternative data because we don't know, we don't have always information back in time. Uh, so we may use, for example, other data sources, uh, giving uh, here we, I have added some examples, the deforestation authorization or data on afforestation, or we may use uh, some proxies. And uh, if uh, the last resort would be to use some averages from uh, the actual data that we have in the time series, but this would be really the last resort. And in my last slide, uh, I have uh, indicated that the land representation, it is one of the most important uh, aspects in the LULUCF inventory, and we need to, to be careful and we need to make our efforts in order to respect the guiding principles of the MPGs. It should be transparent, transparent, meaning that we have to include in our uh, national inventory document all the information that we used, any assumptions and methodologies uh, in order to be clear to the reader what uh, and how we have developed uh, our GH inventory. It should be accurate. We need to make every effort uh, throughout time in order to, to improve our uh, data collection system. To be complete, meaning that all the, the area under the jur jurisdiction of the country should be represented. <clears throat> to be consistent, we will speak later on, on, on the consistency in more detail. Uh, categories should be, uh, the land use categories that we are using should be in, uh, suitable to be aggregated in the IPC default categories in order to, to be comparable with GG inventories from other countries and also to be accurate in, in a way that it is capable to, to represent all, all land use categories and any changes that are occurring in the country. So 
this is from my side. Thank you. Sika, you are muted. I don't know if okay. there is uh, thank, any. Thank any you very much, um, Ayanis. Um, I think we will move to the presentation by uh, South Korea and then we can people can ask questions during the q a session if that's okay uh, so we have um moon jung kim from south korea um, sharing uh, their country experiences in the land use sector uh, moon jung the floor is yours okay thank you thank you Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, okay, I will start. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Moon Jung Kim from Greenhouse Gas Inventory Research Center of Korea, and I'm the presenter for some uh, sharing some experience in applying 2006 IPCC guideline for greenhouse gas inventory in the land use sector. But uh, 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 we are still <laughs> struggling to uh, estimate the land use sector. So just I, I like to share some status of the greenhouse gas <laughs> inventory of Korea today. Yeah. These are the contents for today. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce the uh, legal basis for the greenhouse gas inventory system and I will explain some uh, general MRB system for of Korea and then I will explain some uh, national inventory status uh, especially for Ludo CF sector and finally I will just uh, um, talk about some uh, issues to be solved for the future. Okay. Uh, these are the national context of progress here. So uh, in, as you can see that in 2010, the Korean government just firstly enacted uh, Low Carbon Green Growth Act as the basic law for the greenhouse gas mitigation efforts. And, uh, and then 11 years later, uh, last year, Korea just announced that net zero emission uh, target to become carbon neutral by 2050. And after that, we uh, carbon neutrality and Green Growth Act was enacted last September. And now it goes in, uh, that act goes into effect since last month. So, uh, uh, the most important uh, thing of the, this law is Korea set uh, its national determined contribution as 40%, meaning that the country aims to uh, reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 40% over its 2018 levels by 2030. <laughs> as you can see this slide, uh, those targets were fully supported by national inventory systems such as MRB guidelines and some development and verification guidelines for country specific emission factor and etc. Okay, uh, secondly, I will uh, I like to talk about some general MRB system of Korea. Maybe many of you <laughs> already saw this slide, but I like to <laughs> share some general part. So uh, step one, just, uh, uh, we, ha we have lots of ministries, relevant ministry here for Ludo CF sector. So um, as a first step, uh, GIR prepares MRB guidelines to determine uh, methodologies. And then the relevant ministries collect data and estimate greenhouse gas emissions with some activity data and the emission factor and the back data as well, according to the Korean MRV guideline. So after that, they, uh, they report activity data and inventory to GIR. So 
And then as a second step, uh, we uh, GIR, uh, um, GIR start to verify activity data and backup da back data for, uh, for, for making a, a draft version of the national inventory. So it actually the verification part, it takes two, at least two or three months here. So during the uh, verification process, uh, GIR reviews methodologies. Even, even though we already set the methodology part in the MRV guidelines, some ministries just <laughs> uh, um, estimate on their own. So we have to check those methodologies as well. And some oh, uh, which activity data is used for the inventory and uh, and we also have some country specific uh, emission factor. So we also checked uh, which which factor emission factor was used. And then we request uh, relevant ministry to revise draft inventory to correct some errors. And after correcting errors, the revised uh, draft version of national inventory is confirmed by working group and committee. And finally, national inventory is released as a form of Excel file through the uh, greenhouse gas uh, GIR website. And these are the institutional arrange, uh, uh, arrangement part. As you can see here, there are some uh, relevant ministry for Ludo CF sector. Actually, I I couldn't I couldn't update update the ministry uh, for Ludo CF sector uh, from this year. Uh, uh, we also have some we, we also have Minister of Environment for wetlands. So just from the, the relevant ministry is changed from the, uh, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs to Minister of Environment and also. Also, uh, here we have a settlement settlements, but we uh, still we don't we can't estimate for the settlement inventory. So they are just trying to making an inventory for settlements. And okay, this is uh, the short timeline for national MRB process. Uh, we anyway we have to finalize the national inventory until December. So we start MRB we start the setting up MRB guideline in January, and then we just ask the relevant ministry to submit the national inventory as a first draft. Uh, uh, this year we request <laughs> last year, a <laughs> uh, uh, last month, a uh, uh, last week. Sorry. <laughs> um, and then maybe three three weeks later, we we will start our verification process. Um, these are the MRB guidelines for national inventory. Uh, we have we have national MRB guidelines here, so uh, we have some rules for reporting and some list of materials for submission to GIR, but they. But sometimes they don't submit activity data or some country country specific uh, emission factors. So, and F, so we just put our opinion after first uh, first uh, review. Just uh, we ask the spec data or we have we ask some activity data, <laughs> and uh, some verification guidance and timeline. Or we also provide. And we check the list of uh, we check the report of QAQC as well. Uh, we use some uh, IT IT system to accept the national inventory and uh, and upload the upload the uh, upload the national inventory. And we also put our opinions into this system. So. Uh, G, GIR also use NIRs, NIRS to request to correct errors to relevant ministry like 
this slide. So if, if we find out some missing data or some calculation error, we just classify the error type and then just put the opinions here. And then the relevant ministry, they checked our opinions. And after reviewing these, these ones, they, they just correct their errors and resubmit us to final check. Uh, to 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 op applying for 2006 guidelines, uh, we we just we set up the national greenhouse gas inventory manage management plan. It, uh, it it it's happening between relevant ministry and GIR, but it it uh, this document is open to the public, but <laughs> it is it's written in Korean. <laughs> So um, uh, its purpose is to improve national inventory quality, but uh, these days uh, we are we are already on uh, go ongoing ongoing. Uh, we are uh, how can I say uh, here? It, I I made some mistake. Uh, uh, it shows that second plan is under preparation, but it's already set. So uh, on March uh, this uh, on last two months we already check the result after 2020 plan. And so uh, in, on the second plan, we are, focus, we are focusing on applying for two, 2006 guidelines to its, its sectors. It, it, this is a general, general part for National emission, uh, national greenhouse gas emission trend of Korea. So it's from it's from 2020 National Inventory Report of Korea. So uh, the in 2018 total greenhouse gas emission was 727.6 million tons of CO2 equivalents, and the Korea's Total emission is on the rise, but gradually stagnating these days. And this is the uh, uh, emission trends of Lulu CF sector. As you can see here, uh, the main main remover <laughs> main remover part of the Lulu CF sector is uh, definitely forest land, and uh, you can see also some crop cropland emission emissions here and yep. uh, we we can estimate the Lulu CF sector with with uh, some methodologies here as uh, in the previous uh, slides uh, uh, he's, he just in, he introduced some approach and some methodologies here in Korea, we we applied uh, we apply approach one. <laughs> so we on, we because we only have the uh, land land area uh, total total land area for each year. So we can we cannot we don't we don't know how uh, we don't know the the change of change change status of each land. So we are now we are trying to trying to make uh, land use change metrics these days. I think it uh, from from next year we will we will estimate some land use change metrics uh, hopefully <laughs> and and these are the uh, applied applied method and emission factor in Lulu CF. Uh, as you can see, uh, we uh, we estimate only four categories here. So mainly the forest land, and uh, secondly uh, cropland, and third, thirdly and grassland. And uh, it was very it's very minor part, but we also estimate wetland. So um, uh, most of the methods. Uh, from the GPG guidelines and the, some some methodologies for forest land and wetland is from 2006 guidelines, but and especially for the wetland we use the 
uh, annex, annex part from uh, 2006 guideline. And, um, and here, uh, in forest land, we just uh, we can only estimate biomass part because we are uh, the because due to the lack of data for uh, uh, dead organic matter and soils. And uh, on the other hand, uh, and the cropland for cropland and grassland, we only estimate uh, soil carbon because we don't have we don't have the data for biomass or dead organic matter. So uh, just uh, that's why I said uh, we are also, we are still struggling for <laughs> estimating the whole for whole uh, five carbon pools here. So this is uh, our inventory is not perfect. Still, it's not perfect, but we are struggling. <laughs> Uh, uh, this is the National Greenhouse Inventory Management rule books. So it contains some principles and the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory Management Plan and uh, role of National Greenhouse Gas Inventory Management Committee. And also it, it, uh, said it explains the MRB process and some uh, country specific emission factor development and IT system as well. So, uh, as I said, uh, we are still struggling to <laughs> make uh, inventory for little safe sector, but we, we've learned something from the previous <laughs> uh, stuff. So, especially uh, domestic verification process is important. We can, we can estimate the whole part of the of our five carbon pools, but, but we are we try to we try to estimate something anyway, and uh, and uh, also uh, establishment of an overseeing organization was needed to solve cross sectoral inventory issues. As I said earlier, uh, we have many many uh, relevant ministries here in Lulu CF sector, so we also we have some issues to be solved. Uh, for example, uh, to for making up uh, um, ch land change metrics, and in the Ministry of Land, they use they control they control the they are responsible for the uh, land total land area for South Korea. So they want they want to they want to uh, mainly apply for uh, land registry statistics, but. Uh, but on the on the other hand, however, uh, in, the for, in the forest land part, the land of agriculture, uh, they they set up some uh, smart farm map for the cropland. So uh, it is a kind of conflict between the statistics and the land cover map. So nowadays we made we made some uh, working group for solving those issues. But I think it, it takes a long time <laughs> for solving that problem. And then, uh, yeah. <laughs> and we have some key challenges here. So uh, we are on the transition, pa transition, way, transition pathway to 2006 IPCC guidelines. And, uh, and we, we find, found out it's difficult to collect activity data for apply 2006 IPCC guidelines uh, like uh, land change, land use change metrics, and and according to National Greenhouse Gas Inventory Improvement Plan, um, but uh, we are preparing greenhouse gas inventory based on 2006 IPCC guideline. Uh, we uh, we also apply. We already applied some uh, applied 2006 guideline in some sectors, but it's not a main IP. It's not a main guideline we use. So we want we will we are preparing for applying that guideline mainly. And 
Lulusev uh, land matrix development is really uh, difficult to difficult to uh, make make up making up uh, making up the history land history land change part. So uh, nowadays uh, we are trying to solve this problem. Yeah, thank, thank you for your attention. This is the end of my presentation. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you very much, um, Munjun. That was a very um, enlightening experience. I think it's it's showing us the, the some of the challenges, but also the successes of what you have done. I think you, you are not struggling. You have already started. So that's a very <laughs> good um, basis. It's, um, inventory development is an iterative process. You make improvements over time, so you you can't do everything <laughs> in one go. So you've done very well. Thank you very Thank much you. for that. Um, Thank you for your for sharing. Your, yes, for sharing your experiences. Uh, I think now, if we go into the Q and A session, we can start with the um, first presentation from Ayadanis. I see that there were some questions in the chat um, for Ayadanis presentation. Let me. I think the first one is um, how, how do you do? How do you include illegal conversion of land? And that one was from Harald himself. Yeah, I can I can see that. It's up. Thank you. Okay. Thank. Okay. Good. Thank um, you. Yeah, uh, I would say that you you address uh, illegal uh, illegal or not illegal. It doesn't matter in terms of inventory. I would say so. You we are. Uh, we are uh, monitoring uh, the land use. I, I do understand that there are some uh, issues behind this, but uh, my my uh, suggestion would be uh, to monitor and to report this uh, land uh, based on on the on its land use. So uh, similar to other land use uh, categories. So if it is uh, forest land uh, illegal forest land conversion to settlement, then it's a settlement. Uh, land that has been converted from forest land and then you apply the respective uh, emission factors. Uh, if if I can if I, I can go to the rest of the questions, Sekai? Yes, please, you can go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So for the second, how do you confirm uh, independently uh, the data collected? Uh, usually the, the verification, if, if you mean uh, the verification here, it's made by other data sources that uh, ideally should be of better quality. So uh, you can use, as you are asking in the third question, you can use for this uh, even remote sensing. And of course, remote sensing is part of the options uh, that you may use uh, for data collection. Uh, it, it needs uh, care with remote sensing because, again, remote sensing needs its verification. You can apply ground truth data uh, or other statistics. And so, as uh, our colleague from South Korea uh, explained, uh, several times there are inconsistencies. So uh, you as experts from the country do know better than anyone which data source is um, more accurate uh, compared to the others. And have a note that several times uh, the countries have several data sources. None of them have been prepared for the GG inventory purposes. So you may establish even an hierarchy between the data sources. For example, one data source may provide accurate data for forest land, another one for cropland. So you can choose from these data sources uh, which information to, to use. Thank you. Um, I, can I check that? Do you have um, additional questions for uh, Uranus? Oh, I see that Elizabeth, um, you may take the floor. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I have a um, question. First, could you again explain about the 20-year um, tracking process? Um, that's the first question. And then the, se <clears throat> the second question is um, uh, within a cropland. You know, cropland always have changes in... Um, in their crops that's planted. So, um, so do we track these changes and uh, also also report 
the increment, the loss and gain in uh, biomass. Um, it's only to the first speaker, right? At the moment. Yes, and then yes, we can okay. move on to the next presenter just to make it easier to follow. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Yeah, for for Elizabeth, for the first uh, for the first part for the, your first question, the 20 years is the IPC default conversion period, meaning that any land use change that uh, or management change that is occurring is affecting uh, the carbon stocks, especially the soil carbon stocks for 20 years. So if we have a forest land that is converted to cropland, this area for the first 20 years would be reported under cropland. But within the subcategory of land converted to cropland, and in more detail, forest land converted to cropland. After 20 years, this land would be reported under cropland, remaining cropland. In those two subcategories, we apply a different uh, removal or emission factor because the dynamics are, are different. Uh, this uh, drives us to the to the position that we need to have information, uh, ideally, preferably uh, back uh, for 20 years, at least if we are applying the 20, uh, the IPC default 20 years conversion period. So if we want to know in, in the starting year of our inventory uh, within its land use category, the history of, of our land, we need to know what happened to this land uh, for 20 years back. And that is the need for um, for better information and for more information back in time <clears throat> for the for the 20 years uh, uh, the, for your question on on 20 years uh, conversion period. Now for for the changes within the land use categories, yes, whenever we have uh, changes within the land use category, we need to track this. Uh, so similarly. Similar to a forest land that from primary forest is converted to secondary forest, and we need to track this change. The same applies to cropland. When we have uh, perennial uh, croplands that are converted to annual and vice versa, we need to track this. Uh, this affects both the biomass in this case, but also the soil. Different, uh, different uh, soil dynamics as well. And in cropland, uh, this is uh, even more uh, important because in cropland, under uh, tier one, uh, accord in accordance with 2006 IPC guidelines, uh, the soil uh, carbon pool is mandatory pool to report. Uh, can, can I just uh, ask additional question? So yeah, yeah crop land, I mean, um, annual to um, perennial, there would be difference, but what about perennial to perennial crops? Because often the uh, soil carbon would not change. If there is no change, if if first of all uh, perennial to perennial, I would say if there are uh, big differences, uh, if you have information that there are big differences in, in carbon stocks, then you have to estimate. If there are no big differences and, and you you do uh, uh, you are able to justify this, we, you can just uh, omit, meaning that these changes are insignificant. But in the cropland, the most important, the most significant changes are when uh, perennial crops are converted to annual and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Unless you have uh, under cropland, of course, uh, classified uh, treat uh, areas, okay, that you have, for example, uh, treat areas uh, uh, according to a national definition as cropland, which are converted to perennial crop uh, crops like orchards, then you have uh, significant uh, changes. Then you you you, you it's, it is good practice to monitor and to report this. Okay, <clears throat> Th thanks for that. My final question, since we talked about this and the twenty years, um, <clears throat> um, in our case, we do have some areas of peatland that was drained say, 1950s and 60s. Um, it's drained, and if you go now, it's already like third rotation of uh, planting. So if, if you go to these areas, you don't even see the peat land, any, the peat anymore. Uh, do we still account for, for, for the um, emissions from drained peat land in this case? 
unless they have converted to mineral solids, yes. But uh, the the um, the twenty years conversion period mainly applies to mineral solids. Uh, peatlands and uh, the, uh, the organic soils are uh, reported um, in the year uh, annual. In the year, I mean, the, there is no conversion period for peatlands. So whenever the the peat is under drainage status, you you have to report this. The only the only exclusion is when you 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 are certain that this, there is no carbon uh, in practice the, in this peatland. So uh, from your description, I would say yes, you have to report this. So no carbon meaning there's no peat, is it? Is that what you mean? No, mineral soils have carbon. Uh, that the carbon, uh, but this is quite unrealistic. I would say that this land has been drained for so many years that the carbon uh, does not exist there. But I, I wouldn't say that this is uh, very likely. So I would say as long as the 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 land has not been converted to the previous status, you have to report it um, as drained land. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any further questions to Yordanis? John, I see John wants to make a uh, question. Okay, sure, go ahead. Um, I'm a bit concerned about the um, the time, so I I, I wonder whether uh, we should um, move on, and my question perhaps can wait. Do you, I think that's probably the right thing to do, isn't it? Because we're a little behind time. Sakai. Okay. Um, I don't know whether. Do we have time? If we have time, I'll ask. But if we don't, then just I, advise. I, I think I think you should ask because this is the practical part. Of okay, the then I might ask a question that colleagues. that other people it would may be helpful for other colleagues. So yes. yes, let me ask. Yes, go ahead. Thank you for your Thank presentation, you, uh, Iodanis. It's very difficult to condense so much in a short presentation. I I just wonder, would it be possible just to clarify the difference between approach one and approach two? I think approach three was fairly clear, but one and two, what is the exact difference? Because the um, the matrices of change that you showed are very similar. In in approach one, we, we are not able to make, uh, to develop uh, land use matrices. So we have, for example, uh, in one year, let's say 10 units of forest land, and we need, we only know in in the second year or in the next iteration that we collect data we we do know that this 10 uh, has changed to 12 so we do know that in approach one we do have a net increase of forest land but we don't know from where this increase ah so you do, you know that something's increased but you can't say which category but this, inc this increase of two may be uh, also translated of a gross increase of five to forest land and uh, a, a gross decrease of forest land of three, which gives us a net change of two. So we, must, we miss these gross changes in, in, in the meantime, where we do have this information in approach two. Uh -huh. Okay, I think that's, that's, that, that's an important clarification. Thank yes. you. Yes, thank, thank you, John. I think that that's also what I just to complement what I had done is just say that in approach one, all you get is the net changes, but you don't know where the changes are, are happening from. While in approach two, because you overlay, if you like, maybe in my in my in, in the next presentation, when you overlay two maps, you 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 know what the changes are, but they are not geospatially located. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. OK, thank you. That was a very good question. And then I think if there are no more questions to Yordanis, then we can just maybe one or two questions to um, Munjun, South Korea. So I see there's already one in the in our list there. OK. Thank you. OK, sorry. Uh, there's a question from from um, Richard on um, for South Korea and uh, can you see it um Monjun? Yeah yes I can okay. see it clearly yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 the uh, our team is uh, our team is uh, working uh, working about uh, greenhouse Sorry. gas inventory 
sorry to interrupt, but uh, maybe some people will not will, don't have access to the chat. Uh, at least I don't. So please, uh, can you also uh, read the question uh, to, sure. to the benefit of everybody? Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Marcelo. Do you want me to read it, or Monjun, do you want to read it? <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. Okay. I'll okay. go ahead. So this was a question from Richard, and it says, "Good day. Thank you for your informative presentation." A question for Korea. Is there, um, is there co a component of the GHG MRV system for quantifying uh, greenhouse gas reductions of mitigation actions? Or are there countries with MRV of mitigation actions that can be accessed easily, which can be used as a, as a reference? So it's probably more on the mitigation side. Yes, uh, uh, that's not my main job, but I can I can say something about the uh, mitigation. Uh, 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 we 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 I think the another team he, in GIR they are they are estimating some intensity factor like uh, emission uh, uh, total emissions is divided by uh, activity data. So they can measure the performance of the performance of the uh, reduction reduction. So, but I think I, I that's all I can <laughs> say here. Thank you, thank you. I, I guess maybe if you want, Victor, you can follow up with uh, Manjun and then she can contact her mitigation colleagues and then you can maybe get. Uh, more clarification, but th thank you, um, Manjun, yeah. for that for that uh, question for that clarification. Um, are, are there any more questions to uh, South Korea, Manjun, in, for from her presentation? Uh, there is a, there is another one uh, from Hon Chu to okay. Manjun. Yeah, there is another one uh, that oh. asks. Uh, whether the GAG, the National GAG Inventory Management Rulebook, is available in English, Monjon? Oh, I'm I'm afraid <laughs> we don't provide the English version for the management rulebook. Yeah, but it's very short, so maybe you can you can translate <laughs> using Google. <laughs> I think. Oh, okay, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think because we are running behind time. Oh, is there another question? No, we are running behind time. I think for me, my just clarification to you, Manjun, was the was that to you, you you said in your presentation you have um, challenges setting up the land use metrics. Uh, do you have any remote sensing maps for South Korea? And and I know that the Landsat maps sometimes they are freely available, but of course, is the time and resources to process them so that you can generate um, land matrices, land use matrices uh, and land change. <laughs> I cannot answer of that question, but I heard, I think the Forest Forest Institute, yes. they are, they are, uh, they are sur surveying, they are using some survey methods, mm -hmm. uh, like a sampling, sampling methods okay. like Germany. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think uh, Jordanis wants to uh, add yes. a question. Just, I'm just yes, a, very, a very quick note. A very quick note for uh, for the colleague from South Korea and for the rest. Uh, in my presentation, I already included some data sets for the three parameters. So ecological zone, climate zones, and soil zones. You have already information from now on. So please go visit these data sources and uh, you can use them. They are uh, based on the IPC 2006 IPC guidelines. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Yodanis, for that um, intervention. And also, I think uh, just to reflect on what South Korea presented, I thought your presentation was very good in terms of reflecting on the institutional arrangements that are required to collect um, uh, information for compiling the the Afolo inventory, but also in particular the the Lulu CF component, alongside with the legal framework that mandates uh, data collection. I'm assuming that you already have some kind of a framework for data collection from the different um, stakeholders, because that's a very key point to support other 
participants or countries who are also trying to do the same to set up systems for data collection. So that was um, a, a very good point from your presentation. Yes. OK, um, if there are no more questions. Um, oh, there's a there's a. Oh, it says, please take a look at the FAO right. next to. OK, yes, sure. exactly. So, guys, uh, I want just to try to answer to the question of uh, Richard. Uh, sure, go ahead. There is a GAG MRV system for quantified GAG emission reduction of mitigation action. So actually right now in FAO, we develop a tool that is the, called the NEXT tool, the NDC expert tool that is really doing this exercise, this kind of activities is an accounting tool that help in uh, uh, translating mitigation action in GAG emission reduction. That is uh, foreseen for also the NDC tracking. If a country wants to not only track the implementation of policies, but they want also to convert the mitigation policies in actual GHG emission reduction, we know that that is not still a proper shell, but in a country with capacity, they can even do that. Is a really focus in the follow sector, so help help countries uh, to identify policies and having this uh, uh, evaluation of the GHG emission reduction uh, and it returns annual uh, value. So that's help also for the Drakio and uh, So uh, please have a look Richard and if you have any specific uh, question just uh, contact us uh, through the website uh, to the ETF at FAO uh, emails and we can put you in contact with the technical expert for more uh, more information on that. Sorry about that. No, that's good. Thank you. That's very useful because I think it's, it's, it has actually um, given everybody an opportunity to know what tools exist for the mitigation and how you move on from your baseline projections to the mitigation. So thank you. That was a very good um, intervention. And of course, people can copy the link. I think it's been included in the in, the, in our meeting chat. So thank you, uh, Mirela. Um, if there are no more questions, uh, then could we have a short five minute break? I think. Yeah, so just a quick break for five minutes and then we yeah, should. We, we are we are a bit behind, not being it well behind the time, but I think it will be good if we yes. take a short break and please yeah, don't go anyway and uh, come back in five minutes so we can continue. Yes, thank you.
Okay, I think <laughs> we have taken our five minute break. Uh, can I check everyone is back? We're going to go into um, small uh, breakout groups. Uh, there'll be there'll be three groups. Um, they'll be um, chaired by myself and um, the Ricardo team and, and also for, um, Rosa from PADPA. Can we, uh, maybe Aaron can help us sorry. with the breakout groups? No, sorry, Sikai. We will have the breakout groups after your input. Ah, OK, that's sorry. fine. That's OK, yeah, that's OK, that, yeah, that sure. It would be better that yeah, you will give okay. input and then we will go into the breakout groups. OK, OK, so I'll upload my uh, presentation. Sure, thank you. OK, um, can you see my presentation now? Yes. OK, thank you. Um, I think following up, following on from what um, Jordan has presented this morning, uh, I will be covering um, basically the section on adapting national land use classification systems to the IPCC land use categories, and of course, how to use some national statistical databases for the purpose of estimating the affordable GHG inventory. But of course, within the context of um, LULCF, we also just heard from Korea on how they are using their national data in um, estimating greenhouse gas emissions. So my presentation outline, just briefly, I will look at what we expect to learn from this presentation. We'll look at the land use definitions in the IPCC guidelines just briefly, because I think Yodan has introduced them quite well. Uh, we will also look at how to adapt the national land use classification systems to the IPCC land use categories. Uh, a, a few um, ideas on IPCC practices for aligning national land use classification with IPCC uh, categories, and then some examples of on national land use definitions and adapting uh, national land use um, into the IPCC land use categories. Uh, a little bit on the generation of land use and land use change matrices, including how you annualize your metrics once you've um, generated a, a, a land use metrics. And also how to ensure the national classification system should be used uh, consistently over time. I think also Jordan has touched it briefly on that. Uh, we will look at a small exercise on consistent representation of land. Um, just to check, um, you, ha you have understood what my colleague just um, described in the previous uh, presentation. And then we'll look at matrices and how they are used in, in reporting, of course. And then a little bit on the uh, uh, Paris Agreement and the common reporting tables within the context of LULUCF. So by the end of this uh, presentation, uh, maybe you can reflect on these learning objectives so that you have a better understanding on the importance of adapting national land use classification systems to the IPCC land use categories. Also understanding the definitions of land use as presented in, in the 2006 guidelines. Uh, describe the characteristics of IPCC good practice guidance for aligning national land use classification with the six IPCC land use uh, categories. And of course, um, how to generate um, annual matrices. Uh, the approaches, I won't go into detail there because I think uh, Johannes already covered that, but we will look at, um, we'll spend a bit of time on the land use classification so you can have a, a better appreciation of the common reporting tables under the uh, Paris Agreement because that's, that's the future, that's what we have to do when we report. Uh, so I will skip this slide and go straight to land use definitions. Um, I think Johannes gave us a very good um, background to this. So we should use national definitions of land use which are consistent with the definitions that are uh, used in the IPCC 2006 gui guidelines. In other words, in volume four of the 2006 um, guidelines, as you can see there, the IPCC identifies six broad categories here for the purposes of um, reporting greenhouse gas emissions and removals. Um, 
The first one is forest land. Uh, what is always important to do here is to go into the guidelines. I know some of you say they have not used the guidelines before, but in order for you to make sure that you are following the good practice guidance in the 2006 guidelines, I'll go to chapter four, for example, if I want to understand what the definition of uh, forest land, chapter four, of course, of volume four, the IPCC guidelines define forest land as all land with OD vegetation, again, which is consistent with your thresholds that are used in your national definition of what forest land is. So basically, it also includes a, a system of vegetation structure that may fall below the that uh, legal threshold, but may have a potential to, to reach your, your maximum tree height and so on. So the IPCC guidelines provide guidance on estimating and reporting, of course, anthropogenic emissions only from managed land, as, as, as it is assumed that undisturbed forests neither are sources nor sinks of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. I think we had from Johannes' presentation this morning uh, that once you have stratified your land into managed and unmanaged, you then uh, have to um, stratify it again by land use. So forest land is, is the first one. So countries should really, again, consistently apply their national definitions of managed forests over time. Um, countries may also use their own definitions of forest land, but sh should use them consistently, consistently across time. The UNFCC will always ask for an explanation if you have maybe submitted your national inventory report, but they notice that the uh, national forest definition that you have used is different to what you have maybe submitted in other documents or reports. So it's important that when you are deciding on how to define forest land in, at a national level, you consider the following thresholds that you see there on the left side. So the threshold of a minimum forest area or minimum mapping unit, the crown cover and the tree height. This also should uh, say whether you're including or excluding plantation forests. And also there's a requirement for separation of your indigenous or natural forests with um, plantation forests. So on the right side there, you see the FAO is an example of um, forest definition there. As you can see, there's a threshold for your minimum forest area, which is 0.5 hectares. And then again, the tree's potential to, uh, to reach a particular height, in this case, five meters. And then the minimum tree crown cover. Uh, the predominant land use on that area should be forest land. So these are the, are the uh, considerations you need to take into account when you are setting up a national definition of what constitutes forest land in your country. And then going on to cropland, again, according to the 2006 guidelines, cropland, this is again chapter five. I would always urge you to go into the relevant chapter in the guidelines and then look at how you align the definition of cropland, that is the guidelines, with your national definition. So in this case, if you are going to define land, agricultural land or any land that is considered cropland, you need to include all the arable and tillable land, your rice fields, your agroforestry systems, where the vegetation structure falls below the threshold that was used in forest land. Yeah, and it's also not expected to reach those thresholds at a later time. Uh, cropland also can be further stratified by annual and perennial crops. I think that was the question from Liz earlier on uh, on on um, under cropland. Uh, again, some countries will say land that is set aside for some years again will qualify as cropland, and and what the uh, annual crops include. There is also some countries that may define uh, agroforestry systems or orchard vineyards and plantations under cropland. So long as these uh, tree tribes or orchard do not meet definition of forest land in your country. Rubber trees, bananas, again, these also are lands that could be categorized as uh, forest land, but in some cases it depends how the countries have set their thresholds. Yeah, and um, moving on to, to grassland, again, you go into chapter six of volume four. Grasslands um, includes all land that is um, considered as rangelands or pasture land that is not considered under cropland, including woody vegetation or any other non-vegetation, uh, such as herbs or bushes. Um, in most cases, grasslands are generally have vegetation that is dominated by perennial grasses. 
Uh, again, this is nationally defined. So your definition of grassland at a national level should cover these um, IPCC considerations or at least good practice guidance on how you define land. In some countries, grasslands are extensively managed. In some countries, you have savannas also that are extensively managed. In some cases, even fertilizer or irrigation schemes are applied. And then for wetlands, again, this is this will include any land that is covered or saturated by water for, for all or part of the year. That does not fall into these other three categories that we've just discussed. Again, in the existing 2006 guidelines, guidance is restricted to managed wetlands, which means where the water table is artificially uh, controlled. I think also we had in the earlier discussions, we have uh, pitlands that have been drained for so many years and so on. So there is a human anthropogenic effect on, on that piece of land. So pitlands are cleared, in some cases drained, again, for, for pit production or for horticultural use and so on. And then you can have reservoirs and impoundments, again, for energy production. I must say that for the wetlands, uh, I know that the 2019 refinement is can be used on a voluntary basis. There is more, much better guidance on how to estimate and report emissions from wetlands in Chapter 7 of the uh, 2019 refinement. So please do um, consider that when you are estimating your emissions. Again, here just to distinguish wetlands, the category wetlands has got flooded land and pitlands. So the guidance in the 2006 guidelines has this um, distinction. Uh, and then for settlements, again, settlements include all land that is either residential, commercial, uh, that has infrastructure on it, unless it is also already included in other land use categories. Uh, settlement includes soils, herbaceous, perennial vegetation, and so on. Other land, uh, this you, includes what we call bare rock, soil, ice, or any other areas that do not fall into those other categories. So it's very important that when you are estimating uh, or defining your land use, national land use classification, it's aligned with these definitions of the six IPCC land use um, categories. Now I'll move on to how do we adapt national land use classification to the six IPCC categories. So in order, of, I understand that maybe some of you are not familiar with the 2006 guidelines. In order to use the 2006 guidelines and in some cases uh, implement the IPCC inventory software tool as the tool that actually does the calculations, uh, you need to first uh, identify a national land classification systems of and that of land use uh, for estimating your greenhouse gas emissions and removals. Again, this means in step one, you must first establish correspondence between a national land use category and the IPCC six land use categories. So in other words, you first need to assess the definition of each national land use category and then identify a corresponding uh, land use. So here, if you look at the screen here, we have an example here. This is just a standardized or mapping of land use categories. In this case, land cover or national classification maps and then versus the IPCC categories. For some countries, any land that is considered agricultural land is aligned with cropland or in other words, it's IPCC land use category is um, cropland. Uh, meadows and scrubland, again, this is considered as, for, as uh, grassland. And then under forest land, you have here a, mi a mix of native and forest plantations. So in other words, I think, um, again, going back to our presentation from Yordanis this morning, uh, when he was talking about classific uh, stratification, further stratification. So under forest land, for example, you could divide your forests into native and plantation forests because the carbon stocks for these two types of forests are are different and then the, the methods are slightly different for estimating. And then for wetlands again, it's, uh, wetlands are stratified in some cases by soil type. You've got your organic and your mineral soils and the wetland type. And then for settlements, you have in this, on the left hand side, you have urban and industrial areas. This is what in this country, for example, this is a just a, a, an example. 
And then you have areas without vegetation, snow, glaciers, bodies of water. In this case, they are, th this country classifies them as other land. And then we also still need to capture unmanaged land. In some countries, I think, uh, again, going back to uh, what Yodan has highlighted this morning, some countries consider all land as managed. And some countries have to then take into account if they have managed and unmanaged land, you need to keep track of unmanaged land so that when you are reporting your emissions, is the emission of the total emissions and removals of the total land mass, so the total country area. So for that reason, we do not report emissions from unmanaged land in the inventory. We don't include them, but we include the areas just for record keeping and ensuring that the total land area is accounted for. And then in step two, once you have established a correspondence between the IPCC or and the National Land Use Classification, you then use this mapping to develop your land use matrices, which then show your conversions between categories. So for example, here you may have agroforestry in national classification, uh, which may be classified under forest in the IPCC land use categories. In the example you see here, this is from South Africa. As you can see there, they are class, the, the, the class name is uh, co uh, contiguous uh, forest combined with very high, low, high, medium. And then you have the inventory class there, which is your IPCC uh, class. They, this, this is just forest land. It's been disaggregated between three different forest types. So you can see that you have your indigenous forest, your thickets and your natural woodland. And then on the right hand side, you can see the class definition. So if for land to be considered as indigenous forest, for example, it must have naturally tall wood vegetation with 75% or more canopy cover and so on. So as you can see here, this is how we map or align IPCC land use classes with uh, national land use uh, definitions, which could come from your national forest inventory in this case, or your, le your land cover maps. Now, I'm just going to show you a few examples here of how that is done. In this case, you have your uh, IPCC and the national classification. This is another example there. Uh, this is an example which we took from another country that we have worked with. Uh, as you can see, the under forest land, you have your dense, moderate, sparse, and woodlands. That's in the IPCC category, that's forest land. So you'll be mapping these national definitions, of course, with the areas for, for each of these land uses. And of course, if you then want to apply the 2006 guidelines, it's important that you, you first go through these steps of actually aligning your, your national classifications, of course, the, in the related areas as um, uh, the presentation this morning just highlighted. Now, um, the example I've just shown in the previous slide is basically a reclassification of their national land use categories into the six IPCC land use categories. Again, this implies that all land has needs to be accounted for in the compilation of your greenhouse gas emissions uh, and removals for their full sector. And again, the land cover change data in this example was provided by a, a local regional center for mapping resources. They also had their geospatial institute. They had their forestry commission, which forms the basis of your land use and land use change, in this case for forestry analysis. Um, originally, they had 17 classes there, which were then condensed to seven. And also note that land change mapping within the 17 classes and the IPCC, uh, in this case, we are saying seven because there is a stratification there under perennial cropland and annual cropland. But normally, of course, it's six IPCC. This is just a subcategory there. But this is was taken directly from a land cover remote sensing map. And this is how they aligned their national classification. And this is another example here. I think this is taken from the uh, national Norway National Infantry Report. Again, you can see how the IPCC classes they are aligned with the grey definitions that you see. They are their national classifications, and the the the, the different coloured ones inside the table are the IPCC classes. So they are 
the different way of, of mapping. As you can see here, you have land cover and land usage categories and their correspondence to UNFCC land use categories, but really it's IPCC uh, land use. So this is referenced as seen here. Now, I think maybe just to highlight that this whole session is about how we collect activity data. And what do we do when we collect that activity data? So in order, for example, to, to develop a land use and land change metrics, you need to follow the following steps. So the first thing is to, uh, depending on what your data sources are. For in this case, if you have remote sensing data, for example, you have two maps which are produced using a similar methodology, for example. So in other words, you may have two Landsat maps, one in 2000 and another one in 2010. And uh, these two land maps should use the same classification of land uses. Uh, in some cases, you can also have two Sentinel remote sensing land cover maps. And again, I think just to make sure that people understand that the, the remote sensing maps give you land cover. That's why you always need to align the land cover with the IPCC classifications, as I showed you in my previous um, slide. And then once you have identified your maps, the two maps need to have a consistent land use classification. So countries really can generate land use and land change matrices for, for your area and area change using a combination. This is an example again, because I know there are some countries which do not yet have the capabilities to take use remote sensing data. But for those countries that have access to this type of um, land cover information, uh, which has been collected using remote sensing. So you will then uh, use a combination of the remote sensing land cover maps and also your ground proofing surveys, which we also had again from our colleague in, 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 in Korea this morning. And these are used as an inventory in the inventory as activity data. I've just highlighted here that in day three to uh, tomorrow, the FAO will talk more about some of these tools, the collect, the collect at two, but also the, log the logic tool for generating the matrices. So it's very important that you understand that determining your activity data on land and land area changes is, 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 is important, but there are different ways of collecting this type of information. In some cases, so people don't have remote sensing data, they have national programs, they have agricultural surveys, um, but I must say that generating a land use matrix is much easier nowadays, I think, with um, the use of remote sensing um, um, data sets. Uh, it's also important that the land use matrices in the above mentioned standardized categories should be constructed for annual rates of land use change for different working categories. Um, in, in day three, I will also cover the IPCC splicing techniques, which look at once you've generated your matrix, how do you annualize that matrix? If you have got, for example, three or four different maps, how do you fill in the gaps in between? I will show a bit of some examples here. Um, in this slide, again, this was taken from South Africa. As you can see, they have two land cover maps there. On the left hand side is 2014 and then on the right hand side is 2018. As you can see, you can actually see the changes just by looking at that visually. And then they overlaid the 2014 and the 2018 map to produce the land change matrix that you see here. Maybe this is a bit small, I, my apologies, but I was just trying to demonstrate that to generate a land change matrix, you overlay two land cover maps. Of course, there's a lot of ground proofing as well that will, will be used in order to, to validate what you see from your remote sensing maps. And then on the right hand side there, I'm just showing you the same thing, but maybe uh, in, a, in a slightly different way. But this is a land change matrix. And one of the reporting requirements under the Paris Agreement is that countries should have capabilities to generate these land change metrics because there's a need for you to understand the to estimate the impact of um, emissions due to land use change across time. Here's another example from Thailand. As you can see there, you have your forest area in 1993, and then you have again your for forest area in uh, 1998. Now, if you overlay those two maps, you can actually see here 
the forest area change between 1993 and 1998. So your total forest change area will be those the areas covered by those red dots that you see there. And of course, this will be in the form of a, of a matrix that will then allow you to look at the changes by land use. Now, there is an example, another example here of a land use transition matrix. Here, as you can see, they overlaid the 2003 and 2008 land cover map. Again, in accordance with the IPCC national, sorry, IPCC land use categories there. Uh, I, I mean, the way you read this, for example, you start from the beginning to the end, initial to the end. So our initial year here is 2000, our final year is 2008. So if you want to read that matrix, you know that um, in 2003 and forest land remaining forest land in 2003 it was forest land in 2008 it was forest land so you see here i don't know if you can see my kesa so this is forest land remaining forest land and then if you were to read across this row you know that there's about 2 million uh, 2 million 295 960.60 of cropland that was converted to uh, forest land in 2008 and so on. And these areas here, these rows add up and these columns add up. So this is this kind of matrix you can generate it in, in other tools. Called, there's a tool called GIS, QGIS, uh, which is a remote sensing tool that can also generate these, uh, these matrices. But then it's just generating the area change across time between 2003 and 2008. You, you then want to annualize this matrix. I'll show you in my subsequent slide that to annualize this, you'll then divide by the interval. So let's say uh, between 2003 and 2003, there's five years, you will then divide, this can be done in Excel as well. You then divide this whole table, the numbers in this table by five. So you see in my subsequent slide, I, I have a similar one here for 2008. To, to 2013 for the same country. And then we have another one here for 2013 to 2018 for the same country. Now, how do you generate annualized? Because remember, we estimate the inventory on an annual basis. So the capability to generate land use change, annual land use metrics is, is the key here. So you will then divide uh, that whole, um, um, this whole, um, matrix by five years because this then gives you the annual rates of land use change. I must say in this case we are assuming a very simplified system. In other words, we are assuming that the rates of land use change between 2003 and 2008 are constant or they are the same. In reality, this is not the case. But for a country that is starting from nothing from ground zero, this is a start. That's why I kept saying to our colleague from South Korea, you are not struggling, you have already started. So this is a very uh, complex uh, sector and every step you take is taking you somewhere. So don't be discouraged. This is very good. So you start from something like this and then you, you make assumptions for tier one. I think the key thing to understand is that in the Lulu CF sector, we have the IPCC have a lot of simplifying assumptions, but these are good practice simplifying assumptions. So when you apply those assumptions, you must then document what you have done. In this case, we can say the rates of annual land use change between 2003 and 2008 were, were constant because we have divided this uh, matrix by five and, and so on. If you look at this one again, to annualize this one, the difference between 2008 and 2013, again, your six, then you divide this by that difference between, this is how you would annualize this, this matrix. You do the same for the one from 2013 to, to, to 2018. Now, when you are presenting your national inventory report, this is what you would present, depending on how many land cover map you have. And I, I don't know if you've had time to look at your uh, national GSG template. Uh, there's, there'll be a requirement for a whole section on land representation. And in that section, this is where you'll be presenting your system of land representation that you have established in your country. And then you're showing the how you generated your, your land cover maps. And, and this is the practical part of it. 
and then you, of course you have to explain the data sources and so on. Um, if I move on to how do we ensure that the national classification system is used consistently over time? Now, I didn't go into the details on the practical examples here. I'm just explaining very briefly at high level that in order to ensure national classification is system is used consistently over time, you need to consider uh, the a consistent use of your land representation system in terms of how you acquire your activity data. I think Jordanis again highlighted this very well this morning on how you ensure that you collect your activity data uh, in a way that will ensure that you have a consistent land representation, land representation system. So you have to use the same land use definitions across time. In other words, the six IPCC land use categories there, that's one way of making sure that once you have aligned your national classification system to the IPCC, you use the same classifying system across and those land use definitions should be kept uh, across time. Again, you, you, you land use cover maps with similar land use classifications. In some cases, you may get, um, I, I have an example before with another country where they collected their data which from 1990 to maybe 2014 using Landsat, and then from 2014 they used Sentinel. So whenever that is done, it's very important to check how the historical emissions were, were, were uh, historical land classes were, were done. And if there's a difference, this is quite a, maybe a, a quite a tricky issue on how you then adjust to make sure that the land use definitions are the same. Uh, maybe this is something that could we could have a whole session on this alone because it's, it's, a, it's a whole complex thing, but it can be done. I think maybe I should say that with inventory compilation, in particular in the Afolo and the LULUCF sector, you need to be pragmatic, but document what you have done. If you do anything that is uh, maybe just not so consistent with good practice guidance, but you can justify it. it's very important to then document what you have done because re, uh, people who then look at their inventory, they can understand what you have done. Also, it's important to identify the approaches for you for used for land rep, for representing land areas and land use databases that are used for the inventory. I think uh, Johannes again gave those nice examples in his links on these different approaches, but also on the different data sources that can be used for generating activity data. Um, I now have just a small exercise. I, I, I hope, I'm, am I going too fast or it's okay? Okay, I, I just have a small exercise here on approach two. If you take into account how you read the matrix here, your initial and your final. So for example, if you have forest land at the beginning of your inventory year, and at the end of the inventory year, you've got forest land, remaining forest land, and this is 50 hectares. And again, if you know that this, these rows add up and the columns add up, you can you can work out what those gaps are. I think this, this again relates to what Johannes presented to you this morning as the approach to most countries at a minimum, they, they do this. Because if you remember, the first one was just net area changes or gross area changes it doesn't it doesn't tell you where the changes are happening but with approach two you know what your initial area was you know what your final area was in that inventory year you know where the where the changes came from so you know that two hectares of cropland were converted to forest land you know that six hectares of grassland were converted to forest land and nothing for wetlands and you you have two hectares of settlements converted to forest land, nothing for other land. So what is this? What is the final area there? The rows add up, the columns add up. Anyone going to try? Yeah, this rose add up. So it's this one. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes, good. 
Yeah. Yeah. And then shall we try this one as well? If you think of the rows adding up and the columns adding up, we can we can figure this one out as well. Okay, because we we're, we're running out of time. But anyway, I will show you. Thank you very much for whoever said 60 here, but thank you. Uh, then again here, because you know that the total, if this row adds up and this is 37, so basically you can subtract from, from here, from what you know, you already have here uh, three hectares of forest land to grassland. You have seven hectares of, of, of cropland to grassland. So you can actually know what the difference is because there's nothing there. So that's how you get 27 there. Once you know your 27, this row also adds up. This, sorry, this column adds up. So you can add all of this up, you get 41 and the same here. So it's important that you also understand how to read the matrices and how the matrices function. Okay, now I'll talk a little bit again on the matrices in terms of reporting these land uses because you'll be required to present a matrix like this in your national inventory report. So it's also important to understand how to read them and what kind of information they, they give you as a compiler. You may need to present this maybe to your ministers or to your policy makers. Uh, they want to understand what the land use change is looking like in your country, either for a particular year or for the whole time series. And now because you, you need to have capabilities to generate these matrices, on an annual basis. So it's important that you understand how, what kind of information do matrices have and when we are reporting, what do we, how do we use them? So this, basically these matrices are used for annual reporting, your information on land use and land use change. Uh, so for example, let's identify here how matrices are compiled, what information they contain and what they look like. So here is just a fictitious example of a country which has been subdivided by different strata, climate zones. Actually, this, this slide is from the FA World training material, so I should have included the data source there. Uh, then for each stratum, again, a time series of annual matrices has been prepared, as you can see here, stratified by the climate zone, uh, by soil type and so on, and the ecological zone as well. So if you look here, this is the inventory year for 2005. So again, we read this from initial to uh, final. So in 2004 uh, to 2005, we had unmanaged land, unmanaged forest land, remaining unmanaged forest land, and we have uh, 6,000 hectares, 308 there. And then if you then read across that, we know that there, was, there were no transitions here. There were no land use changes from these other land uses. So the, your total remains as in hectare, it remains as 6,308 and, and so on. So you, you, what you see diagonally here are the land uses that are remaining in the same land use. They haven't changed. And then as you read them across here, you can see the transition. But the total land area, what you see here, this 1,349,522 is your total land area. When you sum up all of these land uses, your total, area should, total land area should always remain the same. If you produce an annual matrix and you see that this area is changing, this total land area is changing, you have to go back to your data processing and check maybe there was an error somewhere because the, 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 the total land area should remain constant. It should not change. Yes, there will be transitions between these different IPCC land categories, but it should not change um, the total land area. And then now, if you look at the same inventory, uh, again, I have yes. to jump in as a moderator now. <laughs> okay, go ahead, go ahead. We, we are running uh, quite behind time now because we okay. also want to give time, as you know, to the discussion. Yeah. Maybe yes. you can, yeah, um, I I can skip. <laughs> go through yeah, the, some yeah. of the slides because we will share the slides anyway, but it will be good if you can give an overview and then we move on to the discussion. Sorry. Okay, okay. yeah. OK, so anyway, I think some of this information Johannes already covered on how you 
read the matrices and how you come up with 30 annual matrices there. Okay, and then I'll talk a little bit. I think I'm, I was almost coming to the end. Here, I think just for you to relate the current MRV system and what is going to be done in the future. So for the Paris Agreement, all countries have to report their inventory using the common reporting tables. And what we have done here, we have extracted the LULUCF ones into this presentation. I think, of course, Rosa, we sent to them, right, the Excel file, yes. So you should also have a copy of these uh, land use metrics. So I will just demonstrate. We will send it. We will send everything, ah. uh, the slides and the Excel sheets, everything uh, after the workshop. Yes. Oh, OK, so you will essentially get these uh, uh, templates, for the common reporting format. As you can see here, there's a requirement for you again to report the changes in greenhouse gas emissions. You, you must report first your total LULUCF, again, net emissions by gas here, and then disaggregated by IPCC, IPCC six land use categories. Again, stratified here again by land remaining in the same category and land converted to that category. In this case, you've got forest land remaining forest land and the same here for the other land uses. What I just also want to highlight quickly is that most of these uh, common reporting tables have footnotes. Please do take note of what these footnotes are doing. They will help to guide you in, in, in the reporting of this information. So please uh, make use of them. Now, there you go, your table 4.1, 4 this is your land change metrics. So you'll be required to report the area here in kilo hectares uh, for your on an annual basis. Every year you must present area and area changes between the previous and the current inventory year. Again, please do take note of the footnotes here. They'll, they'll help you. So it's important that for those of you who are now transitioning to reporting using the 2006 guidelines, but also following the guidance from the MPGs, you'll be expected to produce a matrix like this. And then I have also, we have also at, uh, attached um, a, I don't know, we don't have time. Do, do I show the the different uh, CTF tables briefly? Or I need to move? Uh, I think, yeah, we can, um, sh you can briefly show them, but uh, maybe uh, when we will share them, everyone then can go in details through these tables. But okay. you can, yeah, maybe briefly visualize them so um, okay. uh, colleagues here know what is it. But Again, we will share all the information for everyone to go through the details. Yes. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing this and just briefly. Um, okay, can you see it? Yes. Yeah, I, I, we, I just had to generate a, a contents page here, but anyway, this is the one I've just shown you. As you can see, the table four is just a sectoral report for all the land uses for the uh, LULUCF sector here. And then table 4.1 is the expectation that you have to produce an, a land transition matrix like what you see here. And then now you have the individual land uses here. So as you can see, it, here you'll be expected to generate your annual area information. In other words, your activity data following the guidance that we've just been given this morning from Johannes' presentation to also what we've done here on the national classification. So your activity data information is expected. So what you can see here in these white uh, cells here, you can actually enter your information on the subdivision, but also on the area uh, for, for each carbon pool. As you can see here, you have your three different carbon pool. You've got your implied emission factors here, um, again, if you've got additional information on harvested wood products, again, please do to take note of these uh, footnotes as well and the documentation box, which you can provide uh, the, the type of information that they are highlighting here. So as you can see for forest land, again, you need to report forest land remaining forest land and the conversion categories here. In other words, the other land uses that are converted to forest land and these these uh, tables are similar for each land use. 
land remaining in the same category, the area information, the carbon stocks, the different carbon pool, again, do follow the uh, the, gui the guidance and the footnotes and so on. So this is the same for grassland, it's the same for wetlands, and then the same for settlements. You have other land, and then you have direct and indirect uh, uh, nitrous oxide emissions from managed soils. And then you also have here emissions from drainage and rewetting for the for the for the wetlands. And then you have for those countries that uh, sorry, this is again uh, direct and indirect end to emissions from the mineralization, which is associated with your soil and also the, the from the leaching resulting from sorry land use land use or management in mineral soils. And then we have another one here for biomass burning. So can you see that for biomass burning, you got to know the areas under each land use that have been affected by fire or any kind of natural disturbances. And there's a distinction here between controlled burning and wildfires. So the, the level of activity and the detail of information is much more intense. And then you have your uh, harvested wood products here, again, for those countries that choose to re estimate the and report the, um, the emissions and, and removals from the harvested wood products. As you can see, the data requirements here is quite a lot. You got to have your data on the different wood products, your solar wood, your wood panels and your paper, your import and your exports and production. So there's quite a lot of uh, detailed activity data that you have to collect here. So. OK, so I'm going to I'm, I'm done, I think if uh, hold on my I was just going to summarize quickly. Uh, so I'm going to go back to my. Um, presentation again. So just to conclude, essentially, I think it's important that we have a, a good understanding of how to define our national land classes, establish a correspondence between your national land use definition or class with IPCC. Once you've established this correspondence, you need to map, you need to use this mapping to develop a land use matrix like we have shown in previous slide, but also adapt your national land classification align in other ways with your IPCC uh, land use categories. Ensure that the same land use classifications or definitions are used across time. Identify the different approaches for representing land areas, and then understand how this information is used in the generation of activity data for greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, Paris Agreement is introducing another level of uh, reporting format through the use of common reporting tables for the Afolo sector, but in this case, we only presented the LULUCF uh, sector. OK. Um, and show. Uh, OK, I can stop sharing that. OK, thank you. I know we are running out of time, so uh, I need to check. I don't know if there are questions here. I haven't seen. I haven't looked yet. Um, for this presentation. Um, OK, so I see the first question is from. John. No, I think we have a hand. Let's take the um, uh, okay. uh, participant questions first. OK, uh, we'll, we'll come back to the questions. Just trying to find time. who that hand is. OK, sure. Uh, it's M. Um, I do beg your pardon. It's M. Y. No, Sheila. Has your hand, please. Hello, yeah. Hello. Um, I'm, hi, my name is Noor Sheila from Malaysia. I would like to ask something related to uh, remote sensing, which you, uh, uh, first of all, thanks for the good presentation to Mrs. Tikai. So I am I'm interested with the, that you mentioned about uh, Sentinel and Landsat for, for bringing the land use 
land use change. Uh, my question is, what classification type or algorithm you use for both satellite image? And do you have a, a problem or experience on the processing uh, images uh, for each year? And how do you see the consistency of your data? And uh, I would like to know how you solve the problem if there's a problem on consistency. Thank you. Okay. That's okay. my question. All right. I think it was a series of questions, but I'll, I'll try and answer them. If I forget to answer one, please come back to me again. So the first issue dealing with the um, use of uh, remote sensing data, what tools do we have? Uh, there's the uh, QGIS tool that is used to uh, process the data. When you, then the tool will actually overlay within the uh, GIS tool. You can overlay the two remote sensing uh, maps. But first of all, you need a, a license to actually access that tool. Uh, my understanding that it's free for some countries if uh, the lens that data is free, Sentinel data is free, but the the tool that you use to process that data, you need to have a license, like the ArcGIS tool. You need a, you need a license to use it, and then that tool is able to process your uh, information. In other words, the overlay, the mapping of your national classification, plus the remote sensing land cover maps. What you then need to do, once you have overlaid and you have generated a matrix within the GIS tool, you will then produce a matrix. And that matrix, again, you make sure that you align your national land classification with your six IPCC categories. But that's done within the, the that software or the, the tool called ArcGIS. Uh, with regards to... Uh, the uh, uh, making sure that if if maybe for some years you have used Landsat and for some years you have used Sentinel, it's not normally encouraged. It's always best to use or to overlay land cover classific land cover maps with the same land use classification. I know for some countries, rarely they have combined both Sentinel and Landsat. Most of the countries that I've worked with have actually used. Um, Landsat maps, which can span back, I think, to the 1990s. So you find that, for example, with Swaziland, they had a 1990 map, they had a 2000 map, 2010 map, and a 2015 map. So they could actually overlay those maps across time and then produce matrices. But in order to fill the gaps for the intervening years, then you need to use um, the IPCC splicing techniques, which we are going to cover tomorrow. So I think in a nutshell, maybe you probably need additional training on how to use the QGIS tool because the data processing is quite um, time consuming and needs, needs a lot of resource. So a, a lot of the national experts that I've met, they have actually uh, been trained on the use of the QIS and you also you need to work with the GIS expert because the remote sensing data on its own just gives you the land cover change for the area and areas for the area, total area and the change in areas, but it doesn't uh, tell you what, what the land use is. That's why you always need to ground proof your remote sensing data with uh, your national land, land use maps. So in other ways, the, the land surveys or the national forest inventories in some cases. Um, I don't know, did I leave anything out? Okay, uh, I think uh, additional on the consistency of the data between okay. each year. Yeah. Ah, the consistency. Let's say if you have used uh, the Landsat data for all your land change maps, uh, to make sure that you have a consistent time series, you then need to apply, this can be done in Excel, you then need to apply the 20 year transition uh, period. In other, remember this morning, uh, Johannes mentioned that um, you need to apply to your land change categories, you need to apply your 20 year transition um, period. So you need to apply that across the time series to make sure that 
you have consistency, but also the use of the IPCC gap filling techniques. We, we can maybe to, tomorrow when we go through the time series uh, gap filling exercise, we can have a look at that. Okay, uh, is that mean 99 piece and uh, we have to add 20 years? That's mean 1990 yeah. plus 20 years for? Uh, no, once you have, I, I have an example, but it's, it's, it's data that I, I have not asked permission to show you. Basically, uh, once you have generated your time fill series and you've filled in the gaps, you then up multiply by the 20 year, by 20 years across the whole time series but you need to have your area and area change information first. Um, I don't Sekai. know if show this. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Sekai. No, That's no, it. I think it's better if we follow up this uh, response tomorrow when you talk okay. about consistent time series. Uh, yeah, okay. Otherwise, uh, we're going to enter in much details and yeah. some people may not have yet the background to, to follow up your explanation. Okay, and, sure. And just uh, okay. the, the fact that I took the floor, just to also recall everybody to tomorrow, we're going to have a presentation on Collect Earth that is a very interesting tool that is available that can uh, be used uh, to uh, collect and, and process some of the information that is needed uh, to, to produce the maps and, and the time series. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. thank you. Thank okay, you, Marcelo. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then I think, John, you got your hand as well. Um, I think somebody's answered the question. I think uh, uh, Paloa, sorry, I've mispronounced your name. QGIS is free. It's it's a um, geospatial tool, free to use. The data sets that you use with it may not be. And if you're using remote sensing data sets like Landsat, I, I'm not an expert here, but you may need to clean and process them. And that's that's the issue. Um, I also noticed that the FAO in the chat um, has put a link to a tool that processes uh, remote sensing data. I'm not entirely familiar with this, but I'm going to stop at, at this point. OK. OK, OK, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, John, for that intervention. I think it also clarifies the, the issue on I had mentioned on licensing because I thought maybe they need a license, but anyway. Not for yeah. QGIS, but for the data that's used in it in and it. The tools yeah. to clean the data yeah. so that uh, it's suitable for use for a LULUCF inventory and AFLA inventory, possibly. Yeah, yeah, because the, the ones the ones that I've seen using it, they told me they had to get a license. So maybe it's that p bit of cleaning up the data. Yeah, so, but um, downloading the tool, I suppose it's free. So maybe once you have downloaded the tool, I think there's a requirement to register on the on the website, and then you can take instructions from there. ArcGIS yeah. mm -hmm. is a proprietary piece of software that is expensive, really very expensive, mm -hmm. and um, countries may need to pay quite a lot for that. But there are free alternatives such as QGIS. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. OK, thank you. Thank you, John, for that intervention, I think. And then tomorrow we're going to get more detailed information on the Collect Earth tool, which I, which I know from the FO, that one is free. <laughs> so we'll get more information on how to generate the activity data from the remote sensing data. And also they'll talk about their logic tool as well on generating the matrices. Um, if there are no more questions, hands, let me just quickly check in the in the chat. Um, John, I think your first question will the new IPCC filter to generate this CRS. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, yes, I know that Sandro and the team in Japan, where I used to work, they are actually working on the IPCC software. The idea was that the the the, the outputs from the uh, IPCC invent software should feed into this. Remember the discussions we've had before about the limitations of the software was that it was not able to generate the output in a format that then allows you to complete your common reporter table. So that is being worked upon at the moment. I don't know if Marcelo, you have more additional information, um, but that is where we are at the moment. And I know they, from day one's presentation from the UNFCC, they did mention that they'll be testing it soon, I think.
mid 2023, yep. they'll be testing the first version, piloting the first version of this. I, I, I think this is a good moment to try to, to connect the dots. So mm -hmm. first of all, let's be clear that uh, uh, you're going to have or you have the IPCC software that in the current version allows you to uh, produce estimates of emissions removals in all sectors, uh, mm -hmm. including the LULUCF sector. Uh, of course, it is a kind of limit tool, uh, so it, it doesn't, I mean, give you some options, but it is, has his limitations. What I understand is the IPCC is now uh, revising and updating the software in order to, particularly in the land use sector, uh, give more options for the users. In doing that, they are also talking to the NSCCC secretary to see how they can coordinate both the IPCC software and the report software that the secretary, UNFCC secretary, has to develop as a result of Glasgow. And I think uh, now, uh, with the presentation of Sekai and tomorrow presentation of Collect Earth, we are talking about a third software that is normally the software that people use when they uh, they have the uh, satellite image and they have to process them uh, in order to generate the maps and they have the activity data that is used to calculate emissions and removal. So I think it's important for people to understand that there are different softwares with different purpose. And of course, the idea is that when you have your national system, you're going to choose the softwares or platforms or tools that are more uh, fit for your needs. And of course, uh, you can uh, have the resources to assess them, not only financial resources, but technical capacity. Particularly when we talk about remote sensing, uh, there is a treatment that you have to do with all these images in order to get the real data that you need to use. Uh, we, we hope that with this you, you have an overall view, but of course the details of each uh, of these softwares and how to integrate them, this is something that in my point of view is a case-by-case -case discussion. I don't know if your Dennis want to to complement or to jump in this discussion. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to complement uh, because different organizations, different partners are working. We are working on different tools. My strong suggestion to everyone is to to try to understand how the GG inventory is developed. So, even if someone is working with Collector or the IP software, please, my suggestion is that we need to know what. In, on the background of the of the JG inventory, what is happening, how the calculations are made, because a lot of times there are mistakes. On the other hand, the countries need to know the dynamics uh, <coughs> and, and how the software and the needs of the software in order uh, later on to to try to develop the 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 data that are needed. So the software it does only help us and does not save our lives. And that's my point. So I, I strongly suggest that we 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 study and we try to understand the the background uh, of the JG inventory development, and we use, of course, any software that helps uh, our work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, um, Yotanis, for that intervention. I think Rosa, you got your hand up as well. Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a very interesting discussion to follow, and uh, we realize that yeah, there are still many unanswered questions and we hope that through this discussion we we are providing some clarification on that and i wanted to kind of mention here that since we are behind time we will not go into breakout groups but we will keep uh, continue having maybe another five minutes of uh, uh, discussion in this plenary so please uh, bring your questions and your comments so we can address them here through the open uh, q a i wanted to uh, maybe take the question from harold himself that he wrote in the chat about the um about the lack of funds and capacities and human resources and also in some cases political will in the countries that may pose challenges to countries in preparing their reports um, to the uh, their, their reports on their mitigation actions. Um, um, we, we of course realize that and as I mentioned already yesterday in my opening presentation, uh, the, uh, here we at the Secretariat of the Partnership on Transparency in the Paris Agreement together with FAO, 
together with uh, Jeff funded projects such as the CBIT. There are many other projects, for example, those that are implemented by the Global Support Program. There are a range of uh, projects and organizations that are um, collaborating with countries globally in different regions in order to help them to address these um, uh, gaps in terms of financial and technical support and human resources support so countries can still um, fulfill uh, these requirements for reporting. And of course, it's it's not always probably too comprehensive, but maybe again, I can raise that um, also here, um, uh, Mirella already earlier shared that there are different tools that are available, different resources that are available from FAO side. And uh, yeah, countries can make use of various sources in order to receive support and in order to work on the reportings and also reflect the needs uh, of the country. Uh, tomorrow, uh, I will again share um, based on the, these three days discussions, uh, uh, I will again uh, make connections or links to what kind of support received from us at the Secretariat as well. So I just wanted to, to mention that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Rosa, for that um, very useful um, information on, on, on funding. And um, I think it's good that countries know that they can access uh, some of these funds in order to set up the systems. For example, the processing of remote sensing data. I know that they are giving money to do some of the things that um, Rosa has just highlighted. So you are not alone. There's help, financial help as well, and technical help, of course. Um, I think there's Mirella as well. Mirella? Yes, if you don't mind, you know, I want to pick up from one of the comments uh, of the participants uh, talking about uh, uh, the issues of uh, uh, staff uh, fluctuations and uh, changes. Uh, you know, this is something very common that we face in developing country. And actually right now, especially in the LULUCF sector, what we are trying to do is also to try to bring it in the university and the research institutes that they can maintain the knowledge maintain uh, uh, the, the capability in especially in doing the remote sensing is a work that we are starting doing in Zimbabwe. Sekai is already knowing that. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, but it's uh, something that in Asia we have done also, for example, in country like Mongolia, um, where they are tending to use their uh, the institutes that they work mostly on remote sensing information to ensure the, uh, the stability of the production of the data uh, in order then later on to be able the country, the government to try to do the estimates because the data uh, provision of the LULUCF sector is quite peculiar uh, compared to the other sector. So where more research is for sure needed. Um, so th that is an option that uh, we are saying we also stimulate a lot the support of the university as a training of the trainers as data providers uh, as uh, uh, researchers for more higher tier for example so uh, that's taken into account as a potential option and also in that cases there are so many out there financial resources for the inclusion of the so-called non-state actors in the in the context of the UNFCC process so just uh, uh, just dropping a message to our participants so that that could be also an option yes thank you thank you um Mirella for that intervention um let me just have a quick look uh Uh, John, you, you mentioned something on flexibilities. Maybe you could mention flexibility. Yes. You, so in other words, there, there was a lot of discussion, wasn't there, about yes. the flexibilities that country ha countries have to report. Mm -hmm. um, can either yourself or Marcelo um, make any comments about what flexibilities that, you know, you showed a lot of tables, Sakai, okay, and, sure. and countries may be a bit concerned about those. So are there any flexibilities that apply? Um, to allow countries to re report only parts of that information. That's just a question, Marcelo. I see your hand I up. Think maybe Marcelo can answer that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, well, uh, there is no specific flexibility in the MPGs related to uh, the land use change matrix or, or the LULUCF sector uh, 
activity data. So, but within the IPCC, you have tier one, two, and three, uh, and you have the three approach that was explained by uh, your donors. So my uh, sense is that, of course, uh, developing country parts in particular will not start with approach three uh, immediately uh, or using tier two and tier three. They will have a, a more uh, stepwise approach, a learning curve, and most likely they will start with approach one for the land uh, uh, classification, uh, tier one for calculated emissions and removals, and then based on the support they receive, they will be able to make uh, constant improvements to the inventory and, and migrate to approach two, three, tier two, tier three. So I think this is the main message. You should not be uh, concerned that, well, I cannot do the best. Of course, the, nobody can do the best in the first time they, they approach the problem. But I think within the IPCC, you have ways to present your information that, of course, uh, could always be improved. But I think this is the, 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 the meaning behind the, the inventory. This is a constant learning by doing an improvement uh, across time. So I hope this uh, clarify uh, the questions. And your Dennis, maybe you can also complement what I said, please. Yeah, I fully agree with uh, with Marcelo. And there is no flexibility in terms of uh, approaches. Uh, in any case, the IPC recognizes that, uh, as Marcelo said, the, 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 the approaches can be used uh, through a combination. However, there is flexibility in the time series. So. Uh, the, the starting years should be the 1990, but uh, when flexibility is applied, the parties shall mandatorily uh, report information on the reference year of their NDC. And uh, if I remember well, no, remember well, it is in 2020, uh, should, shall be the mandatory from 2020 onward. Um, and uh, also they have to, to report annual time series and, uh, and other flexibilities for the last year, uh, for which uh, basically uh, we, uh, we report um, uh, two years before the current year and using this flexibility, the parties that they're using this flexibility, they may report three years back from the current year. So these are uh, the flexibilities related to the time series, not to the activity data and to the annual uh, need for reporting GG estimates. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Dennis, to remind this, but uh, to everybody to understand this is for all the inventory. So you're not so, so we, we don't expect that a country present, okay, for the little roof chef sector, I will apply this flexibility provision. I have a short time series, and for the other sectors, I will have a complete time series. This will, this will create probably some uh, confusion. Uh, so uh, it's important that if you want to apply the flexibility uh, provisions for the time series or the end year of your time series, then you should think about this for the whole inventory and not sector by sector. Uh, I think Rosier is telling us that we are running uh, out of time and we have to close the day now. Definitely, it's a very technical discussion and deserves much more time, but unfortunately, the clock is running. Yeah, uh, but Rose we have another day tomorrow. Yes, so that's true. Let's, let's take uh, some of these issues uh, still for tomorrow. I'm sure yeah. we would have lots to discuss. So, so you want me to, to share the evaluation? How you want to proceed to close the day, Rosia? Yeah, let's do the quick evaluation of the day and then we, yeah, we uh, um, move forward to tomorrow and uh, again uh, announce what is awaiting for us for tomorrow. Sure. OK, so thanks. So uh, once again, please, uh, we invite you to go to menti.com. Uh, uh, for the evaluation of today, please use the code 29519968. Uh, there is uh, several slides, uh, questions here, so please uh, go to each one of them and you can put how many comments, uh, responses that you, you want for each one of those questions. So you see here the first question, uh, concrete examples of what you may apply to your own work, what you do differently, what do you wish to try out? Again. 
try to respond to the, this question based on the discussion and information that you received today. The other question will be, uh, what other training capacity development measure would you like uh, regarding your work unit? Again, please try to respond to this based on, on what you heard today. Then, what aspects of the virtual workshop could be improved? And finally, any other remarks you like to leave for us uh, for the agenda development of other activities uh, in the second half of this year? You can put, as I said, as many responses for each one of those questions as you wish. Uh, unfortunately, yesterday we saw a very low participation, uh, participation on, on, on these responses from yesterday evaluation. I don't know if it was some problems with the Mentimeter or, or people didn't have the time. Uh, nevertheless, the code is here and is valid for two days. So if you are not able to, to give the responses today, please try to do it before between today and tomorrow. And tomorrow we're going to have another evaluation with another code. But it's important to us to try to collect for each day what is your thought. So I see here that there is already one response for the first question. I uh, will look into remote sensing data as suggested. Anyway, please, uh, we don't need to wait to you here in the screen to put everything, but try to make uh, as much as possible uh, inputs for all the questions. Uh, use the code that you see here in the screen. And if you're not able to do it now, please do it uh, between today and tomorrow. Uh, I will stop here, Josia. So maybe you want to give uh, some closing remarks. Go ahead. OK. Uh, Rosia, do you still want me to do a quick summary for today and introduce tomorrow, or you want to do the closing remarks bef bef before? Um, I think you are muted. Sorry, yeah, we yeah. wanted also to do a short polling uh, okay. to get some impressions of how today went. So I will ask Aaron now to to help us with the poll. Okay, sure. You should see the question on your screen or you can answer this one in the chat. Rosa, you're still muted. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, I want to repeat that you can take part in the polling by just clicking on your screen or you can also go to the chat and do the polling there. Uh, so I don't know if, I, I, for, from my side, I cannot see the screen. I don't know if it's a problem only with me or everybody seeing the screen. I did see the screen when it showed the poll on the screen. And uh, those that don't see the screen, then you can go into the chat. We see that there were only seven responses, for example, for the first one. Eight responses, they're coming. Yeah, you can you can go on with the voting um, and let us know your views. Good. Yeah, so we see that we have four people that found it useful, and we have five that found it very useful. For some, there it's neutral. Probably they still need to decide whether it was useful or not. And then uh, one person thought that it was not useful at all, which is also, of course, totally fine. Great, yeah, please, yeah, please uh, let your votes come in. And then maybe, uh, Sikaya, let's do a very quick wrap up. And uh, again, yeah, I invite you all, please, to come and join us tomorrow, where we will have even more interesting sessions uh, with the uh, um, three different tools and approaches that will be presented. Okay, 
Right, thank you. Let me close the chat. Uh, okay, so basically, maybe just to wrap up the key messages from today's uh, uh, workshop, um, maybe the first key message was that we need to basically understand the treatment of land representation in the IPCC guidelines and how this is used in the estimation of to generate information on activity data and also how the activity data is then used to estimate your emissions uh, and also the importance of stratifying land. I think um, Johannes did that quite well. Um, Maybe we also heard from South Korea on their own country experiences in using the IPCC guidelines and of course the challenges again in generating land use matrices. But I think this will become more clearer as we proceed. I think tomorrow will be very exciting because we have the FAO again presenting their Collect F2, which is an alternative way uh, of generating the area and area change across time and the logi tool as well. Um, aligning land classification with the IPCC categories, which we covered in, in the last presentation, and also the importance of collecting uh, information on area and area change in a consistent manner, and also aligning the information from land cover maps with your uh, ground proofing national data from the surveys and so on. Uh, we also heard about um, why it's important that as we transition from the current MRV system, how are we going to be using the common reporting tables and what expectations do we have in terms of the amount of data and the quality of data that we need to, to collect. But of course, I think John highlighted a very important point on the flexibilities uh, that are apply so you don't have to do everything in one go. And also, I think Jordan has highlighted that it's important to put everything when you collect data in your national context and the background of the inventory. Marcelo highlighted that we have different tools again, and these different tools should you should understand what they're doing. So for example, the remote sensing tools, we have the Collect app that we are going to learn about tomorrow, which allows you to process your data, your land cover change information and translate it into IPCC land use categories. And then of course the logic tool will generate your land use matrices. Uh, what I covered today is more like another option of actually generating the, the land use matrix using the uh, the QGIS tool. So you have options on the tools that you can use, again, depending on the expertise that you have at a national level. I think Marcelo also mentioned something quite important on understanding that the IPCC inventory software is being reconfigured. So you won't see it in its current form now. It will change a lot to allow you to report uh, using the common tabular format. So the outputs from the software is a calculating tool will come out in such a way that you can then take those outputs and put them in the common reporting tables for the greenhouse gas inventory. Um, maybe for tomorrow, we will be covering information on understanding how to generate again a consistent time series using the IPCC gap filling techniques. And of course, um, the FAO presentations on the Collect Earth tool and the Logic tool for generating land use matrices. Um, I don't know if I have say something that is not correct there. Uh, Jordanis, you can correct me on the how the, the Collect Earth and the Logic tool work, but I, I'm quite excited on, on the Collect tomorrow. Earth because it's going to help a lot of people with the, tomorrow. With the we're simplifying the work, I think. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we will find yeah. that out tomorrow. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, Donis, and thank you, Monjun, also for joining today. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you all. And yeah, please join us tomorrow. Okay. It was a great discussion today. Thank See you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks.